last section of phase two. Uh, and I don't know if we're, I'm gonna have three or four phases. I still gotta work out the trails. I'm still behind uh, with everything else I'm doing, but it's, hey, that's what this is, right? So uh, it's still just the work we're doing. Now, so we're in phase two, we're in the mobile app customization and we and we left off, uh, we completed object specific quick action. So if you remember what we did there as a little recap, Salesforce has two places where you can uh, do stuff, right? They're called quick actions. There's global and there's object specific. Um, global quick actions are that plus sign at the, from the very top of the lightning experience where you can um, not interrupt your work, click on something, create a new lead, create a new opportunity, create a new case, something lets you go. And it's kind uh, anyway, and so that allows you to, you know, get something done without stopping what you're doing, which by the way, I'm gonna put a little tab in here, is one of the secrets to being more productive is how fast it takes you to restart whatever you were interrupted while you were doing it. So uh, uh, some of the, uh, if you study productivity like I have, um, a lot of, and that's the first trail we're in. Here we are, and the, that's the second one. A lot of it, uh, if you look at the research, and I don't know how valid it is, it seems pretty close. Look at your own experience and say, how many times do you get interrupted during the day? Now, if you use a tool like, um, if you use some kind of tool like an instant messenger or Gchat or texting on your phone, and you think about all the times you're interrupted from what you're doing, there's a price you pay for interruptions. And that is the, the cost of the restart to go back to what you were doing. So in the Salesforce platform, there are a lot of tools that are natural, that are built in that kind of naturally bring you back to what you were doing uh, much more quickly and effectively, which actually aids in your productivity. I don't think we're gonna live in a world anytime soon where we're free from distractions, where we're free from interruptions, where we're free from got a minute meetings. And uh, got a minute meetings are, hey, you got a minute? You got a minute, can I interrupt you? Like you already did, now I'm screwed. So what do you want me to do now, right? So the goal is to A, if you can't eliminate those, at least recover from them more effectively. Quick actions kind of allow you to do that. It allows you to do something and get back to what else you were doing much more quickly. So we talked about, uh, the, the, now we're gonna talk about customizing that, uh, that layout, right? We already did uh, the mobile app, which by the way, mimics the lightning experience anyway. So it's kind of good reinforcement for the module we did before. But now we're gonna go into, we, and, and we created the global quick actions, then the object specific quick actions, which are the ones that live on the object record page versus the ones that live at the very top of the page on the global header uh, all the time. <clears throat> so we're gonna jump into customize compact layouts. And we're gonna create a new compact layout as well as assign that compact layout to users because again, Salesforce is designed to present and make available information to the user that can use it the way they need to use it to get their job done. So if they need to just not see it, see it, edit it, or delete it, it matters. It's part of the cred that we'll talk about their profile as. Create, read, edit, or delete. The four basic permissions on an object. Create, read, edit, and delete. Cred. So <clears throat> let's jump in. More, I love this title. More fun. More fun with mobile customization. So, all right. Um, the compact layouts uh, can be a little bit confusing as well as anything else like it's talking about because there's page layouts, compact layouts, buttons and actions, you know, um, mobile page, all these things, right? So uh, every, do you need so many layouts? And like, yeah, because we're dealing with different size screens. We're dealing with different work functionality. We're dealing with different ways that people need to interact with their data because they're in different contexts themselves or at their desk, they're in their car. I mean, they're a passenger in their car, not driving. 
Although if you know how to do it, I'll say, okay. So once you get comfortable with all these tools, you won't even think about the terminology. You just have to remember where it goes. Now, remember, all of this information is interesting and usable. But more importantly, what I want you to remember what's happening with you right now is that the more you start to do something, you'll notice you get a little more comfortable. And then when you think about it later, you think, I don't remember any of that. That's normal Salesforce learning journey. Salesforce has a lot of customizations in the setup that we're dealing with than in the front end that, that end users deal with. End users just deal with whatever's been set up, right? So give yourself a break in learning this material because it is hard to remember all of it. What you need to remember is, is that we have a, with each of these modules, what we're really learning is that each module has a goal or they call them learning objectives. These are our goals for this page that we're looking at. And it kind of works the same way with your users in Salesforce, as well as you, the administrator. Think about one goal at a time, one solution at a time. If you can accomplish that, then call that a win and then think about the next thing you can customize or improve. Now, the benefit of this class, and I'm going to say it because I'm also recording this stuff and one of them is going to sound good enough to promote one day, is that by understanding all these different solutions in different areas, you also understand the interrelated condition of each of those solutions so that uh, a solution in one area, you'll kind of know the ripple effect that it has on other areas. And that's the key important thing that we're trying to cover is that a lot of these things touch each other. And if you're not aware of how the different settings touch each other, um, one solution may cause a, a major problem. So before you go into a lot of these solutions, this is what this, this course and what we're dealing with is going to kind of give you a feeling of, okay, all of this stuff kind of does connect. I remember this, I remember that, and that's good. Because a lot of people change things in Salesforce without thinking about the impact on other settings in Salesforce. So it causes more problems than it solves. So anyway, so what's a compact layout? So a compact layout, um, like when you open a record in the mobile app, you see the highlights about that record. So on the page itself, you notice at the very top of every record page is a white box that kind of has some of the basic information and contains some of those quick actions on it. Well, that's the highlights panel. It gives you a quick overview of that record, no matter what you do below it, right? So same thing happens with a compact layout. You're controlling the first thing someone sees. And it's always better to present the information someone needs immediately versus having them have to click and refresh or even scroll to find. So creating and customizing those compact layouts um, isn't required because there are system defaults that are provided right out of the box. However, they may not meet your user's needs and you need to know where to make those adjustments because while users won't articulate exactly what the problem is, they'll just say things like, I don't know, uh, it sucks, it's all right. I guess like they're not enthusiastic because it hasn't gone grok it hasn't gone yeah wow that was easy right because they're expecting one thing and getting something else or they don't even know they're expecting something but they know what they're trying to do when they look so here in dreamhouse realty right we had um uh d'angelo's has been experimenting with layouts right so remember we've got um uh, for the property object and uh, so check out the screenshots of the property header in the mobile app before and after. So here I've got the property and I got the address. Well, notice on the one on the right, it's the same property, except uh, it says a little more detail about the list price, the MLS number, and any other relevant information that might serve the user. So putting yourself in the shoes of the user as they walk their journey of retrieving, uh, entering, creating, and updating data is really one of the most powerful things you can do. Uh, so putting key fields where it's easily accessible right on the device, right the place where they can find it and see it is really helpful. So um, because the angel, now we're going to follow these steps together. Uh, um, 
he already took care of the compact layout for the property object, but he's not done customizing on his record headers yet. He also wants to improve the appearance of the contact detail page. Uh, so we'll create a compact layout <clears throat> for the contact object, <coughs> which is what we're going to do right now. So I know you haven't launched. We're going to, again, we're still work. We're now working in the trailhead playground. So the first thing I'm going to come back to this section right here, but I'm going to first, I want to now open my playground. So click on the challenge for me. I'm going to, and then I'm going to launch my playground. Now, if you have your developer account in here, that's fine. I'm going to go back to the same playground I've been using in this trailhead. Oh, and this is what I forgot to take as well. My day quill to handle this. Okay, I've launched. I'm going to go to setup because I know I'm going to be there. Now, remember, I'm going to also take, whoops. I'm going to do myself a solid and manage my one screen that you're looking at. Hang on. Whoopsie daisy. Oh, this little second monitor is a pain sometimes. I'm going to change my screen so I can manage my screen layouts. And give myself a little fighting chance of following the instructions on all on one screen. So here we go. So, <clears throat> So what we're going to do is we're going to update the contact compact layout. How's that for a mouthful? So click on the object manager. We're going to select the contact object. You can scroll to it. Let's see if I can make this a little, nope, I can't. All right, here we go. <clears throat> so I'm going to go to compact layouts. And I'm going to create a new compact layout. Remember, you've already got one. It says what builds one by default, which is fine. But we don't want fine. We want fantastic. So I'm in object. I'm in setup, object manager. I'm in the contact object. And I'm going to compact layouts. Everybody good to go? And then we're going to click new. <clears throat> now, because this is a they're going to grade what I'm doing. I want to make sure I get it right. I'm just going to copy the name and the label of my new layout. I'm going to call it the mobile contact layout. And you'll notice what I'm really doing is I'm saying, hey, what are the most hot? So here's the question you would ask as a business analyst as you're doing a survey to your salespeople when they're out in the field. Hey, what's the most important information you need when you're in your car before you go to a listing or when you're in your car before you, when you just arrive at an appointment or those different situations uh, is how you gather this kind of define out what are the priority fields. And then if you do it in a true work study format, you would keep a record of all those fields, matrix it out, see how many votes each one gets and then put those ones. What we decided is that the uh, available from the available fields, we're going to put the name whoops not we're going to put name not account name the phone number stage and the email now why am i picking those well because the instructions say so but think about but but that's not the only reason i'm picking them I'm picking them because if you put yourself in the home, in this D'Angelo's position, these are the fields that are most important while in the field, while using my mobile device. I don't want to click and scroll. Right? I want to put up front, 
available one screen at, at, uh, accessibility. You can have up to 10 fields, uh, but not all fields are going to appear on the screen or on the highlights panel. It depends on the where you place that compact layout. Okay, so uh, so I got name, and I'm looking phone, stage, and email. Phone, stage. I did them in that order. If you want to change the order, you can select them and move them up or down. But I'm good with that, and I'm going to hit save. I wouldn't go outside the bounds of uh, Trailhead. I was just talking to a fellow trainer of mine today. One of the limitations of Trailhead is you got to be so exact. One of the good things about Trailhead is you got to be so exact. One of the limitations is you got to be so exact. So it's just practice. Take this lesson. Go look at how your org is set up if you have the permission to at least view it. If you don't, then uh, you know, go go open your developer, play with that. You get a chance to customize it. Uh, you know, just to kind of get an idea of where it's at. Because applying this to a person's business situation, you know, requires like your journey with them to understand their whole business. Now that we've done that, now we need to assign that compact layout to different users. Now, we don't assign things to individuals when we can assign it to a group that an individual belongs to. So when you're taking the test and when you're thinking about your solution, you have to think about your solution two ways. One, if it's only one, like if there's only one X of it is, of whatever I'm doing, how do I solve the problem? The other way you have to think about it is, what if there's 100,000 of these? How would I manage it then? So that's one of the ways that you got to pick the right answer on the test, but also think about the right solution. Salesforce is designed for up from one user to, I don't know, I think the largest company they have right now might have over 200,000 users or several that have that, like Nutto Michelin has over 200,000 users. And you have to think about all your solutions at scale, both micro and macro, because a, a solution at a micro level becomes unruly at macro and, and macro might be overkill for something that only happens once or twice. That being said, I'm going to go back to the assignment. So I'm going to go to compact layout assignment. I'm going to edit the assignment. And basically what I'm saying is assign the mobile contact layout as my primary layout. Now, where that comes into play, and we'll talk about this as we talk about data customization. Remember I talked about record types. In the tip, it says, right now I'm only assigning it, uh, like Dominic, that wasn't per user, I know. But when it comes to record types, I want you to think about contacts for a second. Contacts are people. There's in your business, keeping track of your data, there's going to be lots of people you do business with. There'll be people who are prospects, people who are customers, people who might be consultants, people who might be uh, vendors, people who might be competitors, right? So those are different types of contacts. Well, I have one tab called contacts. That table of data, that object called contacts, is fully functional as a standard object. Now, I, if I have contacts that are buy, if I'm in real estate and I got contacts that are buyers and contacts that are sellers, I don't want to limit my functionality by creating a whole new object called buyers and another object called sellers. Now I have these two basically empty objects, empty tables of data, spreadsheets, if you will, that really aren't that functional that I've got to rebuild all that functionality. I don't want to lose the functionality of the account contact structure that's built into Salesforce. All the things that are standard, all the things that it works. So I can create a database within a database by using record types, which we'll talk about later on when we start talking about uh, how do you assign page? We did page layouts before. Now we're doing compact page layouts. When you have record types, 
it allows you to then say, okay, I've got customer contacts and I've got, uh, uh, maybe got buyer contacts, seller contacts, competitor contacts, vendor contacts, right? So I don't want to, I don't want to recreate the wheel so I can create record types inside of that where if you're, uh, you know, an administrator, you need to see everybody. But if you're a salesperson, you only need to see prospect and customer contact record types. So it's a way to filter the data so the user only sees the data they need. And that's a theme you're starting to hear in Salesforce, right? Only the user only needs to see the data they need to get their job done. Those users are grouped together by their profile, which is a collection of permissions. It's also a collection of permission assignments. So for example, an assignment. So if I have more than one profile and I have more than one record type, I could separate you know, my inside sales from outside sales. Those, does that make sense, everybody? So anyway, that's what that little tip is all about. And it's just, it's a little more than just a tip. So anyway, so it's just a little more than there. So we're gonna test the compact layout. If you've downloaded your, oh, I had a trouble with this before. I didn't wanna do it again. So um, if, you, if you refresh your, if you do it on your mobile app, you'll see that those fields now showed up. And let me, let me show you what the difference would be. So in my standard system default compact layout, the name, title, account name, phone, email, mobile, and contact owner show up and depend on how much screen space you have. Whereas in my mobile contact layout that I just created, the name, phone, stage, and email are gonna show up. So again, different information is gonna show up in the mobile app. So the name, the phone, the stage, and the email, it's gonna look just like this. And this is the new mobile app. Okay, so you ready? Let's do the challenge. I'll do it quietly together. So we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna do a mobile account layout again, but this time on the account object. So we're gonna switch over to the object manager. We're gonna go to our account object, which lists all of our account data. Accounts are the companies we do business with or competitors or vendors or prospects. Remember, we can have record types. I'm going to go to my compact layout section. I'm going to create a new compact layout. I'm going to call it the mobile account layout. And just like it said before, I want my account name, boom, annual revenue, phone, and then type. Now, another way to think about how you present your data is if you think about presenting data that's actionable. What kind of action am I trying to create? What data do I need right here in front of me to create it? If you can present all the data someone needs to take as many actions as possible, send an email, make a phone call, decide to do anything or not, like the annual revenue. Like if they're gonna annual revenue of 100,000, I'm not touching them. I don't worry about them. They can't afford me. So I click save. So um, uh, that's what you want to think about. In all those crossroads where people meet data, presenting the most data to find the most, to take the most actions is ideal. You can't put it all in one place because then it's overwhelming. So it's a very strategic it's a dance. It's a little bit of art. It's a little bit of science. So I'm going to select that. I'm going to save it. And that completes my challenge. I'm going to go ahead and click for 500 points. Give me a thumbs up when you've got your it's complete. And I'm watching you on the participant. Gag alone. Woohoo. That's what we want, confetti. Mm -hmm. And when we're done, we're gonna go down to customize navigation.
All right, everybody good to go? I'm trying to reset my password, see if it, I can't remember what happened last time. I want to load up on my mobile device. All right, that's what I had happened before. Hmm, okay, there's some whiz gang bang or whatever, so I don't know what's going on there. Okay, so that's fine. All right, so now we're in customized navigation. Everybody ready, ready to go? Gil, you got it. Brian, if you're good. Uh, yep, all right, awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so let's talk about customizing I'm going to maximize and then restore it. So you have two main options uh, for customizing your user's navigation experience, the mobile only app and lightning apps and lightning apps and explain how to, we're going to explain how to get to the menu and mobile app launcher. So um, <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out this analogy here. Um, this is one of my pet peeves. Amy can attest to it. If anybody's ever traveled with me for more than a minute to some unfamiliar place, um, I'll always get annoyed by the fact that most sign makers uh, make signs for people who already know where they're going, right? I mean, the si sign makers and sign order takers, right? People who, who order signs. Order signs, if you're ever going in a building that you've never been in before, look at the signage. If you're still confused, it's because they built the signs for people who already know where things are. And um, it's just annoying to me, but it is what it is. So um, you, if you can, you wanna try to give people cues to where they need to go next. And you can do that in apps as well. Uh, mobile navigation is this, that signpost. So, <clears throat> and, and, and Salesforce really has done a good job of creating their mobile app so that if you just look at the screen and allow yourself to process it a little bit, you will um, uh, notice what to do next, just reading the screen, taking it in. So, uh, uh, you can customize, basically you can customize their experience with either mobile or lightning or both. So, Let's talk about how you meet that, how you do that. <clears throat> um, let's talk about the navigation bar and the updated navigation menu. So the they designed the mobile app and the newest design of the mobile app is really for the thumb, right? And <clears throat> when you go to the menu, you'll see the menus down here at the bottom, close to where your hand typically holds I mean, if, if you remember the old mobile app from last week, a lot of menu items were at the top left, forgetting that most people now can manage their phone with one hand. So it's the evolution of the human and the smartphone are coming together. Um, um, so let's see if this is important. Menu for mobile only app, we call it an app, but it's basically just a set of navigation items, navigation menu, previous app. Blue navigation menu of the new app. Blue navigation items and center screen. Okay, so you can customize the mobile only navigation items and setup the same way you customized uh, the previous navigation menu. But again, a lot of times it's better before you run and customize something that's new. Let you and your users use it a little bit to see if it really is a problem, or if it's just new. So. Um, one way to look at any type of customizations and technology is, is it new or is it broken? So a lot of times it's just new, right? It's new, it's uncomfortable, people don't know how to use it, so they complain. Don't listen to complaints right away. Let them use it a couple dozen times and then complaints are more relevant. So anybody that can, so for example, uh, some of y'all work for a, a fellow who happened to be a former F-16 pilot and he'll have an opinion about 
how things work the very first time he sees it, not even uses it. Because it's a new system, of course, everything's not the way you had it. So it can't necessarily be the way you want it if you want it the way you had it. And this is true for any new system, by the way. So you work with a new customer as one of our consultants. People are drawn to what they know, to what they're familiar with, what they're comfortable with. You have to ease the transition to, is it incorrect or is it new? You have to decide. And a lot of times it's just new. And if you just give yourself time to get used to the new, it'll be, especially if you know it's more efficient than the customer, then the customer will get the efficiency and then decide if they need it improved. Okay. Um, so again, you can change what's available in the menu items. Um, or you can just leave it the same. Recommend it leaving the same. So the, uh, the most important thing is this right here. The four most important items in your navigation menu. So one, two, three, four. Those first four things should be the most important things that someone can access with their thumb at one hand in their phone. So the way you test the mobile navigation is you pull your phone out and with one hand, can you get, get, get to most things you need? And that will bring out those and then it'll start coming down the line from there. That make sense? So chatter, today, dashboards, tasks is chatter, today, dashboards, tasks. Now see that? So that's the most important thing, the top four. You won't be tested on it, but you'll need to know it, paying attention to what's happening, what your settings are, and how the impact is on your user screens. <clears throat> so um, the app launcher is now on mobile as well as desktop. So that's pretty great. Um, if you've enabled any lightning apps for mobile, users can switch to those apps using the mobile app launcher. What does that mean? So like if you've got, I don't know if MailChimp is, but let's say you work with MailChimp, you got a MailChimp app. If you make it mobile ready, Basically, you can access that app from your mobile phone as well. <clears throat> so that the, uh, let's see if it, yeah. So as they click on the app launcher, they can have access to all of their apps that they use. <clears throat> and if a user has permission to change the tabs on their desktop view, it'll also change on their mobile view so that, Salesforce provides that seamless transition from desktop to mobile. And, and I'll tell you the reason why they're doing it, why they put so much time and effort in this. Because Mark Benioff, the, the co-CEO of Salesforce, is like, I only want to run my, phone, my business from the phone. $13.5 billion a year, and he runs it from an Apple iPhone. Now, granted, he's got a lot of people picking up all the little details. You know that, right? Okay. So... Uh, you want to switch back to mobile only, you can switch back to the mobile only uh, uh, launcher. But this is where you can go to all your different apps that are built in. So what you can change. Uh, the items in the mobile only navigation menu um, are those things that are set up here, right? The mobile navigation menu or what you set up here. And then when you click the app launcher, Uh, let's see, da, da, da. and you can fine tune that navigation menu. The first four items are the first four items at the bottom of the navigation bar and items in the navigation menu of a lightning app. Uh, you, uh, if you have the right permissions can change the order of the desktop tabs and see the changes on the mobile device. Um, and again, the first four items in the navigation menu are the first four items in the bottom of the mobile navigation. Now, let's see what this says about mobile navigation. Uh, you cannot set different configurations for different types of users, but users in the Lightning apps with the right permission can change their navigation on tabs, and those changes are reflected on mobile. So basically, what they're saying is you don't control it for users. You give the users permission to control it for themselves. By the way, 
you can always, let me tell you what, um, if you're ever on an implementation or you're a control of your company Salesforce, here's my rule of thumb. And I kind of found this the best practice. If you give them the least amount of permissions, then they'll always be glad if you grant them more. If you grant them the most permissions, they'll always remember what you took away from them, even if they never used it. That's called the Sutherland rule. I'll tell you later why it's called the Sutherland rule. Even if they use it incorrectly, they'll be mad that you took away the permission to make those mistakes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, make sure you read about smart search items. It'll be a link down at the bottom. Uh, that smart search are a list of dynamically um, access of recently objects in the navigation menu. Basically, like when you click on the search, it'll show the first, the last five records you've ever touched, most recently touched. So you could probably go right back to them. It works kind of the same way. Um, we're not going to get into Visual Force pages, Lightning components, but if you want to include those, you have to create a tab for them. And then they can be part of navigation as well. Um, <coughs> like anything web, uh, you have to mobile enable it. You get the choice of doing that, but that's really more of the highly customized data. It's really too deep for the admin tests that we're taking. But if you stick within the bounds of what you can access and what makes sense to you, and, and then you go test what you did to make sure that it makes sense from an end user point of view, you'll always be okay. Does that make sense? Oh wait, I gotta put this next. I didn't put that in the chat. This is the one we're on right now. Yeah, mobile app navigation. <laughs> So in a minute, uh, we're gonna customize this, just get our hands on it. I'm gonna restore my page so I can follow the instructions. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my setup. I'm gonna click on home. In the quick find, I'm gonna type navigation because doing it's way better than talking about doing it. Although it does seem like I get paid by the word, doesn't it? Amy agrees. Okay, so uh, I wanna select Salesforce navigation. And you can see here's my, mo I'm gonna go ahead, let's see if I get a little more room on the page. So what it wants me to do is rearrange the items so that the top five are in the following order. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click, uh, I'm gonna take events and move that up to the very top. If you remember correctly, if you remember, events are anything that happens on a calendar. It's an activity that there's two types of activities, tasks and events. Events happen on a calendar, tasks have, what did I say, tasks and events. Or two types of activities. Tasks happen on a list, events happen on a calendar. So I want events, chatter, tasks, and dashboards. So events, chatter, tasks, and dashboards, and then my smart search items. I'm gonna bring down because it just to be safe. All right, when I'm done there, I'm gonna click save. So anything you put below the smart search items element appears below the list of recently accessed objects, which means there's gonna be a bunch of stuff ahead of it. So now we're gonna, re we're gonna remove a few things too. Did I just click too soon? I did. I saved too soon, it's all right. You can always move it out. So I'm gonna take a few things out that don't matter because that's as important as putting things in that do. I'm gonna take out approvals because I don't need that while I'm out and about. I'm gonna take out pause flow. Hey, Frank, welcome. Jump right on in and we'll catch up as you go along. 
And I'm going to take out approvals and pause flow interview. Perfect. And then I'm going to hit save. And of course, you got to jump in and test on your mobile app. Now, there's a couple of things you can study on your own about the mobile app rollout. You know, I don't think you need to do all that. The mobile app is so awesome. Just if you have control over it, just roll it out. Um, as far as app security and compliance, talk to, if you're in a bigger company than yourself, if you're, first of all, if it's just you and a couple people, don't worry about it. Your security is not that important. Salesforce by default has plenty of security to protect you as long as you don't do something stupid, like give out your password to other people and other things like that. The third thing is if it really comes down to security, find somebody who can tell you what settings you need to do as an expert in security with Salesforce, everything related to sales. Even when I teach the admin class for Salesforce in the five day format and security issues come up, people say, well, how do I set this? How do I set that? I'm like, I don't know, what's your company security policy? What does your company CISSP say? It's a certified internet security specialist something, right? That person knows the details about what your company's got, layers, levels, and all that kind of stuff. Talk to them. Don't go outside. Here's a good rule of thumb with Salesforce. Go to the edge of your capacity, not beyond it. You should always do everything you can do to the edge of your capacity and, and work to expand that edge, but get help beyond that. If you make stuff up over the edge, you run the risk of making big mistakes. So uh, with that in mind, just you know, take it one, one little step at a time. All right, I think we lost Frank. All right, so that's, uh, we're gonna take, so take the quiz and let me know when you're complete. Frank will come back later. Frank's just getting started and he hadn't seen all the videos yet. He's my new coach. Oh, that's not enough. I'm missing, some, I'm missing a big chunk. Hang on a second. I'm going to. Give you a minute. Yeah, I'll have it up, Brian. I, uh, I will send you, actually, it's in a plate right now. It's in a, so I had a little glitch last week, and I'm uh, um, my video recordings were, were going up automatically. And then uh, I'll, I'll get those. They'll all be in one place shortly. They're on YouTube, but you got to go to one and get to the playlist. And then uh, I'll have the playlist loaded, but I'm putting it in the salesandtechnology.com login. Okay. So let me just check a few things real quick. So I want to go back for a second. All right. Yep. Thank you, Brian. All right. I'm closing the chat for a second. So you guys finish that. And then I will hang on, hang on. I want to check something real quick. All right.
Hang on one second. All right, here we go. Let me do something real quick. Experience, counts, contact, light, lays out two, force, dashboards, chat, I'm sure if we did that. So I'm doing a quick review. All right, so mobile customization. Okay, now we sales three, four validation. Let's see if this is the next appropriate thing. Use one and me. All right. <clears throat> I think I'm gonna. Okay. So let's talk about some of the things we've done so far, right? Um, let's see, da, 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 da. let's see, da, 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 da. prepare you. We did that. All right. So is that in this one? No. Okay. All right. Okay. I think this one Okay. The security we're going to get into. Ah, okay. Good. All right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see. Da, 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 da. I just want to change the order of this. So we're gonna jump into phase three. Okay, all right, we're gonna jump into phase three. And I just edited it, so if it looks different, it's because I just made it so. So if you're on phase three, and you don't know what I'm, oh, and you can't even see it, so I gotta make it public. Copying that link, and I'm gonna put it in the chat. As soon as I find my chat box. There we go. Okay, so we're gonna go to phase three. User management. So we talked a lot about like what we're preparing for users. Now we haven't, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the org for a second before we get into like customizing and all the different customization fields and those kind of things. But um, setting up your org uh, and understanding how it, the user role in the org, right? We're gonna talk about that in a second. I think this is the next right one. Add new users. We, we might have already done this one. So you guys check. Did you already completed this? If you've already, anybody completed this trail yet? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know if we've covered this module. You know what? It ain't going to hurt. Did, did we already do this one in this class? Because I know I, I jumbled up my, and I didn't know if we covered user management yet or not. I'm still trying, I'm trying to look to see. Hang on, let me see if I did user management. Uh, 
we didn't do it in the like phase one, phase two, phase three. Data model. Okay. All right. I'm gonna I'll, I'll do user management first. It's pretty quick, and then we'll talk about. It. So, uh, for, let's talk about when you add a new user, and then we'll also talk about uh, then setting up the security protocols around that. Right. So now we're getting in. So now you you start to understand that you're preparing and presenting data to users with the page layouts, custom fields, those kind of things. Right. So. This is all for your user. So we're gonna make sure you understand what a user is, um, how to add users, all that kind of stuff. We get that out of the way. So as an administrator, um, a, a big job of administrators, one job, it's a big job of administrators is managing users. Um, we talked about the Salesforce A application, the Salesforce A is for administrators. Most of the work that you do um, on that app is about users, freezing a user, deactivating a user, creating a user, adding permission sets to a user, unlocking a user's account. All that stuff happens with e each and every user record. Now, so everyone who can log into Salesforce is a user and every user in Salesforce has a user record or user account. Now, and because you, the user, can have more than one account with Salesforce, um, something's got to be unique because it can't be your name, it can't be your email, it can't be your social security number, because that travels with you with each user record. We don't put social security numbers in there. So what is unique? What's unique is the username. What determines which org you actually log into is your username. Now there's two fundamental truths about that. One is that there's login.salesforce.com and then there's test.salesforce.com. Those are basically the only two ecosystems and even there, usernames are unique. So um, uh, a, a user needs certain information that to, to complete a user record. I think we did, I think we did too, but let's just cover it again because you can't go over this too much. So, <clears throat> You have to have a minimum of username, which is unique, email address, which does not have to be unique. However, think about when you create a user record, you typically put in uh, Julia at computerfutures.com because that's a unique identifier overall. So typically companies use the person's email address for their company because somebody only logs into Salesforce for their company. So that's a usually a good um, uh, methodology for creating a username. However, if you take your personal username or if you've logged in somewhere else with your company email, now your company, you can't even use your, your own email as your username. You do need a first and last name. You need a license to, to register into a, 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 an org. There's different kinds of licenses. Remember we talked about the different clouds, sales cloud, service cloud, finance cloud, marketing cloud. All of those are different user licenses. And typically for your org, it's gonna be a Salesforce license. Now, the exception is the chatter licenses, which we talked a little bit about, and I got a little screwed up in my essentials edition. Uh, so I had to take a different route, um, which, is, which is fine. Now the profile, these are all the required fields, by the way. The profile is a required field as well as the role. However, one of the options for the role, it says optional, but it's not optional. It's a required field. Could be no role. So I'm gonna put that in, in writing. Role, even So no role is one of the options that you can choose for somebody for their role. Don't worry, we'll cover all this in. So you could create more than one user at a time. If you create more than one user at a time, you're only gonna have these fields to enter because those are the required fields. If you create one user at a time, you have more information you can put in that user record. Um, so we're gonna go into the org. We're gonna look at the user record. 
Uh, let's just look at it right now. So let me go into the org. So go into setup and in setup type user, just type user, not users. When you type user, there's going to be a whole menu of options, which we're going to talk about. Now, the three P's at the top are really four P's, permission set groups, permission sets, profiles, and public groups. We're going to get into those. Basically, think about profiles as groups of users that do not cross the stream. They're, they're, they are homogenous. Now, like chocolate and milk go together to make chocolate milk, you could create a group called chocolate milk. Well, it's that group of chocolate with that group of milk. You put them together, you got chocolate milk. As far as I know, there are no cows that produce homogenous chocolate milk. If there were, we'd be growing those cows. Now, permission sets and a new thing called permission set groups. Permission sets are additional permissions that you per, uh, assign to individual users to extend the functionality of their user record beyond their profile. So you see the alliteration, PPP profiles, uh, permission sets, permissions, those are all assigned to users, to a user record. Public groups are a way that you can combine different users into one group so you can assign different permissions and easily manage that group. So think of a, uh, you might have, for example, um, it's like the police force, right? Everybody's a cop, but some cops are on the street, some are in the building, some are in the jail, and some are SWAT team, right? They're regular cops who carry SWAT gear. They got special permission to look cooler and shoot things better. So they got special stuff, right? So they're a group within a group, and it, that group could come from lots of different groups. SWAT teams come from both internal and external police. So you could create groups of users in Salesforce to do stuff with. We're going to cover some scenarios with that. The role has to do with the role hierarchy, which is much like, I'm going to click on, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to click on the roles for a second. So click on roles. The role is just this. So you got the CEO, it's got the directors of sales and the sales reps, or you got, uh, you know, VP of hardware, software, and however you group the way you move data in and out of your organization is how the role hierarchy um, is, is uh, laid out. And, uh, you know, depending on how you sell, how you organize, you and how you manage data, you can use that uh, group for I think that's for something that should be over there. You can use that group to manage and control access to data and features. Now click on the user record. Click on users. Oh, they, they made it users. Okay. So notice if I click new user, and do this with me, I don't know that you've got anybody, but just go ahead and create a user in your org. I'm going to create a user called, uh, 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 Drew Freeze. Now, uh, it came up with this crazy little nickname. That's fine. Notice that it came up with an alias, and that alias is always first initial of the first name, first four letters of the last name. That's always an alias. Now, You'll see alias a lot of places, but the user can control their alias. So it does mess with people. You can notice I can give them a title. I can give them a role of none specified, or I can give them a role of all these different spots. So I'm going to give them no role. I'm going to pick a user license. Uh, I'm, I'm limited because I think I already have a user that I assigned my yeah. Remember, she's got a, my Ada Balua. We created her. Ah, this is where it's all coming back to me now, right? So if I go to Ada's record, 
she's using one of my Salesforce licenses, which is different than Salesforce platform. Notice they look quite similar, but they're spelled differently. Now I say it that way because it's true. I'm looking at the screen and you say, well, what's the difference? The difference is they're different. You, first and foremost, I want you to make sure you see that. The difference is that they're different. And while human beings will take things that are similar and make them the same, computers do not. They're dumb. They only do exactly what you tell them. So in order for me to free up that other license from my boy Drew, best quarterback in the history of the football, I remember I only have two user licenses. So now if I go to Drew, Breeze, now I can actually give him a Salesforce license. So every user needs what's required, right? A, a last name, an alias is done automatically, an email and a username. And that email and username typically are the same, but they don't have to be. Everybody clear on that? The username has to be unique. <clears throat> the most important thing you gotta know is when a user record is active, it's using that license. If I freeze that record, if I freeze that record, it does not free up the license. I have to deactivate the user in order to free up a license. Now, a couple of things I wanna tell you about the user record. It's a good reminder. Never hurts to say this stuff more than once. Notice that there are selections on the user record, like marketing user, offline user, knowledge user, flow user. All of those different things are permissions to use different features of Salesforce. They're controlled by the user record. The only one I've ever seen on a test, a sample test, is the marketing user. I don't know why, but it just is. And I'm just gonna tell you this, so repetition is the mother of skill. You'll see it on the test, the practice test, all nine yards. The marketing user checkbox is what controls the ability of a user to create campaigns. There's no create campaign license of permission in any profile. It's on the user record. And you have some of that, depending on the licenses you buy. Some of them are going to be on the user record. Now, I'm, not, I'm only going to choose the, the marketing user one. But notice you can add lots of information about that user, uh, their phone number, their, fin, their stack, their address. Their federation ID is used for single sign-on. So what is that? So at Johnson Controls, my email is dominic.caruba-ext at jci.com. But I also have a federation ID called jcarub D, C A R U B D at jci.com. J C A R U B D is my federation ID. It has to do with the Microsoft Active Directory. It has to do with way technical stuff. But if you're trying to use single sign on, which is the fact that you've logged into your computer allows you to just automatically log into Salesforce, you have to enter a, a federation ID there. That's what that's for, in case you're wondering. Never going to be on the test, but you need it. This is where you set their, uh, you can set their time zone, locale and language, or you can let them set it. The user can control it, but as an admin, if you already know those things, you can set it up for them. It's an easier adoption transition. Now, I'm gonna remind you of a few things. This is on the test. It's what's controlled in the locale settings. Locale settings are not local settings. They're locale settings. It's how the people in your locale read dates, names, numbers, as well as the language and time zone. So the locale settings uh, are your time zone, the, lo the locale setting them itself. So remember, there's different kinds of English, the way that English is presents data based on your, the Queen's English or your particular area, it's there. You can also add the, their delegated approver or their manager. And when you set someone up, it's gonna ask you to generate a password at one time. So we're gonna click save, create a new user. Just wanna show you that. So that's all of the, 
those, those, I just showed you all of those definitions that are in the trailhead for the trailhead users. So I'm going to take you to, I'm going to put that in the chat. So I have a record of what we covered, but I think Julia said it, we already covered this. So you may have already completed this challenge. <clears throat> so remember the username, it's got to be unique. This is a good it's got to be unique across the entire ecosystem of Salesforce. And it's in the format of an email, whether it's your real email or not, it doesn't matter. If your email is amy at salesandtechnology.com, I could have created an, uh, a username of hrbjq at 1257.jet. It's just got to have letters, an at symbol, letters, a dot, and three more letters. Does that make sense? It's gotta be in the format of an email. So what you gotta remember. Uh, you can have the same email on every org if you want, doesn't matter. Uh, passwords, uh, usually the first time you log in, you're asked to change a password. And um, if you get sent an email with a login link, you can only use it once. So those of you that were set up in my chatter group, uh, you got a link. You didn't even get your username. You just got logged in. Um, and we just did that. We just added a user. You could do the Salesforce A app. You monitor trust. Yeah, this does all look familiar. You can freeze a user. Remember, freezing does not free up a license. Only deactivating a user frees up a license. Any questions about that? Awesome. Take the little quiz if you haven't take, taken it already. So now remember, we talked about user security, controlling what a user can see and what they can do. So there's object security and then field level security. Remember, we, as you're creating the fields inside an object, one of the questions in the wizard is, which profiles get to see or edit this field? And so that's field level security which we're gonna cover next for data security. So remember there's a couple of different levels of security built into Salesforce. One is organizational security. That's the username and password, along with any type of IP restrictions, time and day restrictions, what allows that person in the building, the proverbial building of your org. When they get in the building, you know, you've been in some buildings at certain field, certain uh, floors you can't get to. That's uh, Think of that as object level security. Can you get to floor 17? Nope, then you don't have even read access to that. If you can get to the floor, but you can't get any of the doors, you might have read only uh, access. So there's that's where the cred comes in in the profile. Each object has a cred, which is your, can a, can a user with that profile create, read, edit, or delete a record they own in that object, right? That's the object level. Field level security in that object, you can control which profiles can see or edit any field that's in your object. So you can hide the social security number field from all of your users, except executives, accounts receivable and support you, right? Something like that, right? So depending on who needs to see what, you can even control down to the field. And then records themselves. Records are controlled by the ownership of the record. So think about it like a car. Now I know, Julia, you may not own a car in New York, right? So think about when you rent a car, you're being, you, you can't, you can, you're responsible for that car just like you own it, except you can't sell it, right? You can't sell it. Uh, you have to you have to drive it correctly. You have to, you know, park it correctly. You have to fill it up with gas correctly. All those things, but you don't own it, so you can't sell it. But if I own my own car, I can do whatever I want with it. If I lend you my car, you can only do some of the things with it that an owner can do, not everything. So that's record control. So we talk about record access through three very important things. The only place, and we're going to see this a lot, that you can control, uh, I'm sorry, the only way that you can limit access 
to records you do not OWN is through the OWD. So the only way, I'm going to write that down in the notes. That you so the only way you can restrict access to records to users that do not own them is with the OWD that's why I say the OWN is related to the OWD so record access is controlled by the owner all right so think about it like ownership of a vehicle, or ownership of property. We're very, it's very Western civilization kind of thing, right? Property ownership is what distinguishes us from many different societies. Brian, I'm going to go ahead and mute you. Is that okay? Yes. All right, you got it. So again, I'm going to, this is for the sake of repetition. I want to make sure you understand something. Getting into the organization, uh, it's having password policies, uh, login access hours, locations, those things, right? That's the org. Objects is the cred, C-R-E-D. Can somebody create, read, edit, or delete a record that they own in this object? Accounts, contacts, cases, any of them. <clears throat> Can they see all the fields or not? Controlled, all that's controlled by the profile. Now records are controlled by ownership. Just like a car, I can lend you my car. You could be my parent and you kind of technically can own my car if you're a parent, right? But it's, it kind of works the same way or I can share my car with you, but doesn't mean you, you're limited in what you can do with it. So the only place you restrict access to records that you do not own is through the OWD, the organization wide defaults. That's always on the test. You should always remember it. It's the baseline level of restriction to records record access. Now, records are also, think about the parent-child relationship between you and your children. If you are an adult and your child thinks they own something in, while they live in your house, they are sadly mistaken. By law, you own everything that child owns. Does that make sense to everybody? The child is not a sentient human, except in California at the 2016 election, when the high schoolers complained that Trump got elected, no one informed those under 18 year olds that their opinion is owned by their parents. They are not a fully recognized sentient being in the United States of America until they reach 18 laps around the sun. Or they've had a judge declare them emancipated from the tyranny of childhood into the ability of adulthood <clears throat> with an emancipation proclamation. How do I know that? Because I was emancipated at 16. I was 18 at 16, right? I didn't do anything other than write notes to excuse myself from high school. I know I could do it. So ownership also is controlled by the role hierarchy. So remember the role, you got a CEO, a VP, a director, a salesperson. If somebody lower in the organization owns a record, Everybody in that chain above them in the role also owns that record because they are their, fundamentally their parent. They have access to full access rights. It's called full access. Now, if I own a record and you're my sibling or you're my coworker, I can share a record with you and that allows you to read or edit that record, but you cannot delete it and you cannot change ownership of that record because just like if I lend you my car, you can't technically steal it. You could, but you're not supposed to, and you can't sell it. So that's where sharing rules come into place. We share. I can share rules a couple of ways. We'll talk about those three ways to share rules. So there are rules, teams, and manual sharing. And we'll talk about how to set those rules up and how to do all that stuff in the next section. <clears throat> so let's see if we covered all this. Uh, da, 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 da. So here's, here's kind of the question you need to ask yourself. And I don't have a visual with this, but I want you to think about the people you work with, 
right? At, at any moment in time or the organization you're working with, when you're talking with a client, you say, look, let's talk about each, when you s start to set the organization-wide defaults, you ask the first question, is there any single user in your entire organization that should not see any record in this database? And if the answer is yes, your organization-wide defaults have to be, must be, or always going to be private. Lock it down. Why? Because there's no other way to restrict access to that record without making all records private. Does that make sense? Now, I can give back access to the parents, the appropriate coworkers, the other departments, through role hierarchies and sharing. But I can't, but I got to, that's the only way I can prevent I like to call it the proverbial Bob from looking at a record. All right. So um, uh, this is, let's see. So let's see. Uh, what else? Do I want to so, now let's see. These are all good things. So when you have a, um, so the, the permissions on a record are always a combination of the object permissions plus the record permissions. And record permissions are controlled by the OWD. So it's a combination of record level permissions and object level permissions that make the mix. And when it's, whenever there's a conflict, the most restrictive the most restrictive uh, level of permission wins. The most restrictive settings wins. That makes sense. Sales. And that, listen, Salesforce is never going to say, "Yeah, we can't control that," or "We can't do this. We can't do that." Sorry, it. They always can. The answer is always yes with Salesforce. All. And when you take the test, remember I said that Salesforce answers on the Salesforce certification test are never what Salesforce can't do. It's always what it can do. So, uh, <clears throat> all right, let's see. So, organization OWD defaults. So, here's the little example. Who's the most restricted user of the object? So, let's think about this. Let's say you have an object called uh, credit card transaction. And, and, and of all the credit card transactions, uh, there's one person, you have all your sales development reps, all your new people, right? All your, 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 brand, your most least trusted people that you have in your organization. Do you want them to see credit card transactions? No, then all those records must be set to private. Does that make sense? So if it's no, like, no, they could see everything. They could see all that stuff, no problem. Then uh, is there any of those records that they can see that, even if it's one record and one person should not be able to edit it, if the answer is yes, then you set it to public read only. Okay? So your sharing model would be, and if it's no, like, nope, they can see and read. We don't care about our credit card security. Right? That's not true. You wouldn't do that. But let's say it's their contact information. Is there ever a reason why somebody in your organization shouldn't be able to pick up the phone and talk to a customer and update their contact record. And the answer is no, everybody should be able to update that. Then great. Then contacts are typically read, write, public read, write. Why? Because anybody talking to uh, any one of our customers or contacts should be able to update that address book to make sure it's up to date. Would y'all agree with that? Of course. All right. So, <clears throat> Uh, and you do that object by object. You have to run that little test object by object, and then you get down to field by field. Is there any field that any user shouldn't be able to see? And you can restrict it by grouping that user into a profile that can, can't see that field or can see it but can't edit it. Same thing applies. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so you've got uh, one other option called control by parent. And that is on an object, let's say for example, contacts are always part of an account. So in the hierarchical nature of records, accounts are the parent and contacts are the child. 
because you can't have a child without a without an account. You can't have a child without a parent. You can't have a contact without an account. So you can also set the OWD settings to control by parent. Now we're going to do this in a minute. Um, so uh, let's see. I think it's a it's a quiz, but let's let's set let's look at this together. So I'm going to minimize this. We bring my little trailhead back so you can kind of see it simultaneously. But let's jump in our org and let's just look at it together. Because sometimes talking about it, as you can know, is much harder. So when true needs. <coughs> so if you would go into setup and type in sharing because sharing is caring. Not really. Okay. So we talked about that conceptually. Let's take a look at it, relatively speaking. So if you type in share, S-H-A-R-E or S-H-A-R rather, you could see that under sharing settings are the organization-wide defaults. So let's just take a look at it before we click edit. You could see that every object now, every object listed, all of these are standard objects plus all of our custom objects. So every object, right? Every object is controlled by the OWD, organization-wide defaults, the organization-wide sharing settings. So click on edit. And it'll take a second. Mine's probably taking longer than yours. And let's talk about what's happening on the screen. So notice, leads have one additional setting, just like cases that none other have that you wouldn't know unless you know this, right? It's public read, write, and transfer. So if you click on leads, you'll see it, you can set it to private, read only, read, write, and read, write, transfer. Leads and cases tend to be your public facing records. So for example, if you collect leads on a website, Salesforce has built into it web to lead. So anything you can set up a form and collect records directly from the interwebs or any other system that builds that out directly. Cases are the same thing. If you've got a problem, you go to help.salesandtechnology.com. I think that's it. Uh, you get our, our page. And uh, it's actually not that, it's uh, something else, but it will be, it'll be help or FAQ, whatever you call it. You know, you log a case, that's coming from the web. So typically you need the ability to transfer that to the appropriate people, whether it's automatic or otherwise. Now also notice that this grant access using hierarchies that at the end is grayed out. Does anybody wanna take a guess why these are grayed out but the ones down below are not. The ones, the energy audit and the property ones we built are not. Anybody want to take a swag at it? Chat me up. What's the difference between the two at the bottom that I can adjust and the many at the top that I cannot? And the answer is they're standard objects. Standard objects, remember, think hardwired. Standard equals hardwired. Salesforce already said, all right, this is what we've built for you as a structure. By default, by, by design, any of these object records will fall into the rules of the role hierarchy, which means if you create a role hierarchy and you place people in those roles, they'll the the record access will roll up the role hierarchy will roll up the chain right so record access think of the r rolls up the chain 
that you have to share lane. We'll talk about that a little bit more. We look at the role hierarchy a little deeper, right? So the first thing is you got to set the default access for records. So if you set everything to private, if you were to set all, by the way, don't do this right now. You have to, if you set everything to private, it means there's at least one person, one type of user in your organization that should not be able to see any records like this. So when you set the default access to records, your organization-wide defaults, if you set it to private, no one but the person that owns the record can see that record. So this is called a private, I'm doing it right now. This is your calendar settings by default. Again, locking it down by default, which means you gotta add it back. by intention, by design. Now, if I were to do this, this would be what's called a private org. If I mix it up, if I say, uh, accounts and contacts, that could be read only, orders are private, opportunities are private, cases are private, campaigns are read only. Now I have what's called a hybrid a hybrid model because I've, I've made some things private. I made some things read only and some things are read right by default, right? Regardless, not irregardless, regardless of ownership. This is basically saying for records not owned, this controls the access. Records not owned, OWN, are controlled by the OWD. And when I hit save, it'll save all that. I'm not changing any of this right now. I'm just hitting save. I'm just, I canceled it out. Does everybody see that? A couple other things I want to show you. So remember, standard objects are always affected by the role hierarchy. If you don't use the role hierarchy, if you don't place users in the role hierarchy, they don't get access to this. It doesn't matter. Any user outside the role hierarchy, records don't roll up to or through them. Now, there's this, um, this is a new one, the secure guest user record access. This manager group and manual sharing, if you hover over that, you can choose to let users manually share their records. And then manager groups, remember in the user record, we could define the manager. So let's look at our screen right now. There's Dominic, Amy, iPhone, and Gil, right? I'm going to rename you, Julia. Right, there's Dominic. I'm gonna rename Gil from Gil Braum to just Gil. So we got Dominic, Amy, let's say Amy's our manager and on our user record, everything points up to Amy. If we click manager groups, that basically creates a sharing group between us four. So if everything's set to private and I click manager groups, by default, if anybody that reports to Amy can see each other's records because Amy's our manager group. She creates our little team. Does that make sense? That tends to be on the test. Okay. Uh, I'm going to click save for that. It's going to take a minute to rewrite the sharing rules. Doesn't take that long, but it does, it does it right there. So those are the features and functions of the OWD. Any questions or comments about that? Now, wait, yeah. I'm sorry. Can you just reiterate what you were saying about the manager group, just in terms of that hierarchy again? So look at our little Zoom. Uh, are you looking at the Zoom with all the little pictures of us all on there? Yeah. If Amy was our manager, so on our you let me let me just show you. On our user record, if if each one of us had Amy as our manager, 
that would create a group of us. Does that make sense? So that would, that would, that would create a group so that if everything was set to private, I could see your records. You could see and edit mine. It opens up editability and visibility for a manager's team. So it's a quick and dirty role hierarchy is what I like to say. Gotcha. So it's like a team button sort of. It's like a team button. It says, okay, everybody that reports to, let's say, you're, do you manage anybody at CF? Uh, yeah. All right. So if you had a private data model, but you had three people that reported to you, all of you could see each other's records that are working together. Cool. Yep. So again, and I'm going to look at the role hierarchy. Let's expand it. In your org, if you look at your role hierarchy, this is what it looks like. I've got um, the CEO at the top of the chain. It says director, because that's what it's called here. I don't know why. That's just like the org name. <clears throat> this line right here is the chain. Anybody that's connected to the chain, it rolls up the chain of command. Does that make sense? The people who are in different lanes cannot see each other's records. So anybody that owns a record down here, they can't see it, they can't see it, only that person and anybody above that person. So you gotta kind of look at this. We'll go back to role hierarchy. It's, it's the picture, the way it's laid out is trying to be like, this hierarchy here, you get the CEO and all the, every, these are the different lanes. But when you look at it, it actually looks a little different. So any, and you can assign a user in any one of these roles. You could take the lowly sales development rep and assign them to the CEO role and guess what access they have to all the records. Yep, you got it. They have the same access as the CEO. But why do I tell you that? Well. One of the most common blunders that people make as a solution to record access in a private or hybrid model is they just throw people, they put users in higher roles than they need to be, and that gives them access to all the records, especially in that are affected by the role hierarchy. So remember my sharing settings? It says grant access using hierarchies here at this column and all of these standard objects are um, uh, affected by the role hierarchy, except for these two private, right? You could choose whether custom objects are affected or not. Again, anybody I throw in a high, the higher role, they have access to all the records, all standard and any custom records that have this checkbox selected. Does that make sense, Julia? Yeah, that makes sense to me. And when okay. I first saw, I thought it might be like grouping all of the managers within an organization. I didn't realize it would be like splitting it off into teams, but that makes a lot of that's, sense. That's really good. Now, here's what's beautiful about that thought. And I want to, I want to follow that trail if anybody else gets it too. So your manager can see all of their subordinate records. If you click manager roles, all subordinates can see all their records too. So that's a little sideway pass however if you don't have that button control if you don't have that button checked then co-workers can't see each other's records in a private model right because they're they're not they're next to each other in the hierarchy not i'm going to take that away my manager group what happened oh i i don't want to go away i don't know what i did okay uh let me cancel so um so the way you share across the lane is through down at the bottom of OWD. If you scroll down further than the OWD, you'll start to see sharing rules. Now we get into sharing rules. You're going to need to see some pictures of this, but think about, uh, you got two managers. East Coast sales manager, West Coast sales manager, right? East, Eastern and Western. And they both have a team of five people. Here they are, right here. Look, it's controlled by my hands. Just find my hands upside down like that. My two wrists are my two managers. 
None of these people can see any of these people's records. Each manager can see their people's records, but they can't see each other's records. But what if it's important that the sales manager here see the, the records of things happening over there? Well, you can't share records across the lane. That's, that's laning. You use sharing rules to do it. So I create a rule that says, any records owned by this manager's people can be seen by this manager. And any records owned by this manager's folks can be seen by this manager. Does that make sense? It's, that's how you create a sharing rule. And we're gonna do some of those as well. But that's what it takes to do that. Now, um, we're gonna do that when we come back next week. I don't wanna get into all that, but I wanna make sure you understand the concept and where it's controlled by. So if you haven't already, take the quiz, and then let me know if you have any questions after the quiz. I don't know what the quiz is, I can't retake it again. <clears throat> so that's user manager. When we get into data security, which is the next big module. This one's going to take us a couple of classes to get through. It's, it's going to, we're going to refer, we're going to go through all of this again, right? And we're going to, we're going to do each one of these and we're going to go through the data. We'll do the data security model now. So let me put this one in here because this is where we're going to start next uh, Thursday when we get back. So I want you to finish up that quiz if you haven't done it already, which you may have already done. I don't know. Give you a second. So when we talk about overview of data security, it's kind of a re refer to what we talked about, giving people the right access to the right data, the four levels at which you control it, and then limiting access at the four levels. So this will be pretty quick. We're talking about at the organizational level, the object level, the field level, and the record level, which is really just what we talked about. But there's a new picture. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll cover that. And then we'll talk about, oh, I did. I did the horrible on that one. Um, uh, let's see, record modification fields. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like who created a field, who mod last modified it, uh, who logged in, who didn't, which changes were made to a field, and then, of course, the set up audit trail. I must have been moving furious through that one. So we'll, we'll pick up there because it'll be Thursday by the time we get to it. And then uh, we'll start there and we'll go through data security as fast as we can. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. So how's it going so far? Because now we're getting into like, this is going to be the, once you understand this part of security, you really get a handle on how come Salesforce works the way it does. Like how come some people can do things and other people can't and why? you have restrictions on those things. So yeah, we might actually just, this is actually the same material we just covered. Um, but there's maybe a couple of things in here that are useful. So let's see. So this is a good little example. Um, um, In that, uh, what objects can they see? They can see, well, let's say there's a recruiting user, they can see the candidate, they can see the position, but only a specific person can see the offer. So you wanna hide that. What fields can they see? So first name, last name, but home phone, salary, you know, amount, pay grade status, all those are field permissions. Which record should be hidden by default? Private, read only, pri those are your organization-wide defaults. 
And then what exceptions do you make? So how do you make exceptions to that organization-wide default? So again, I like to think of the, the automobile analogy uh, or, you know, yeah, automobiles are great, or vehicles are great analogy. You may have a license to drive cars, but it doesn't mean you can just drive any car. You have to just drive the cars that, you've, that have been shared with you or that you own. And so we'll, we'll, this is a great little example for that. So we'll, we'll pick up here on Thursday and we'll start, and just start as you, as you go through the week this week, as you use Salesforce, I know some of you do, think about, you know, try to, here's the funny thing. As a user, as an end user, it never occurs to you the stuff you can't see. Because why? Because you never see it. It's never there. But as an admin, you now have the ability to see things and not see things in, in accordance. So if you can go, if you have access to the setup menu and, you know, you go to the object manager, I, I mean, uh, you go to the home, I highly recommend checking out the sharing settings if they let you. And so sometimes you might ask for permission for a day or two, like just, you know, to see some of this stuff, to see it in action, to see what your companies have been set up on. And then when you look at sharing settings, you'll, you'll get a very good education about what the rules are underneath the OWD or the sharing rules. Now remember, role hierarchy rolls all those records up the chain. So it's really parent, child, child. It's, it's child, parent, grandparent, great-grandparent, great-great, right? Up the, up, the, up the role hierarchy. So any record um, that is owned by someone at the lowest level is really owned by everybody in that chain. But across the lane is where you see the rules, the sharing rules that control what gets shared from lane to lane. And we'll talk about that um, because sharing rules are about, actually, I'm going to put it in here, sharing rules. So re, uh, role hierarchy I spelled hierarchy wrong. It's at hierarchy at the lowest level. It rolls up the chain, right? Sharing rules govern, control groups of records with groups. So sharing rules are group to group. And when we go through sharing rules, let's see what my, I have a, X, uh, da, 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 da. let's see if I have a private, private, private. So if I, uh, I'm just gonna create a, a new rule here just to show you real quick, uh, dummy. Notice I'm sharing which records. So there are groups of records that I'm identifying right, with groups of users, whether it's a, a, a manager subordinate groups, a manager groups, public groups, roles, roles and subordinates. These are new, but manager subordinate groups and manager groups, oh yeah, the manager groups, remember the, we created the manager groups? So I could say, remember Amy's the manager of us four, of us three? I could say, share the record, share Amy's group manager, because I activated manager, that's why it's new, Right, so the manager group of Dominic, I'm sharing that, I don't know if that makes any sense, but the point is sharing rules are group to group. And we'll, we'll, we'll do, when you, when you do it a bunch, you understand that. Because the next way that we share records is individual records with individuals. And that's through account teams, opportunity teams, case teams, or through manual sharing. So it's groups of records or individual records that we're sharing. So there's only two ways to share, groups or individual. And we could do individual records by team, because we always do it with those people, or by one-offs, one-to-one, which we'll cover a little, we may get to that Thursday when we get to sharing words. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Is this clear as mud? Is it starting to make sense? It's getting there a little. 
Amy's shaking her head a little bit. I can't see Gil or Julia. Because Julia will not get on camera to introduce herself. Everybody, that's all right. We'll get you next time. We'll get you a laptop. You can do it. Uh, Amazon uh, Prime does these little, they had a Chromebook on sale. They have cameras built into Chromebooks, Julia. You can get your own little Chromebook. I'm just in an office, so I don't want it to be distracting to see a million people behind me. Never, it will never be distracting. It's totally fine. All right. Thank you guys. If you need anything, remember, schedule some time with me. My schedule is going to get slam jam packed uh, for the next three weeks. Next week, you know, next week, I'm really busy this week too. But next week and the week after and the week after, I'm leading, including these classes, three classes a day. So by Thursday afternoon, if my voice is shot, uh, I may try to convince Amy to teach the class. I might let you guys teach. All right, your turn to teach a trailhead. All right. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys Thursday. If you have anything, please email me, schedule some time while I can. And if, if there's nothing on my schedule, then just hit me up individually because I might have time that, because my schedule stops at six. I might have stuff after six that I can uh, provide for you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it, everybody. Have a great Thanks, day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Gil, see you tonight.